over 130 members of Congress are asking the Supreme Court to let states defund Planned Parenthood. 108 U.S. representatives and 29 senators filed an amicus brief at the high court last week. The brief argues states should have the authority to determine which Medicaid providers meet their standards. And states should be able to strip these funds from Planned Parenthood, the nation's largest abortion provider. The lawmakers urged the court to take up South Carolina's case on their decision to ban Planned Parenthood affiliates in the state from receiving Medicaid reimbursements. Pro-life groups, including Alliance Defending Freedom, March for Life Action, and South Carolina Citizens for Life are supporting the brief. Senator Steve Daines of Montana is founder and chair of the U.S. Senate Pro-Life Caucus. He was one of the lawmakers to file the brief to the Supreme Court and he joins us now via Skype. Senator, welcome back. What is your message to the Supreme Court? Why should the justices hear this case? Well, Catherine, it's very clear. If you go back to the Medicaid Act of 1965, the law is clear, and that is the states should decide who qualifies as a provider for, uh, for Medicaid funds. And in this case, the, the, state, of Cal the state of South Carolina stated that uh, Planned Parenthood should not be eligible for these Medicaid funds. That is clearly uh, within the intent of what Congress uh, decided back in 1965 with the Medicaid Act, because I think everybody uh, from the pro-life position understands that abortion is not health care and it shouldn't be funded. And I applaud South Carolina for taking this strong stand to defund Planned Parenthood. Senator, what then are the potential implications of this case for the pro-life cause? Well, they're very, very significant because it's important that we allow states to decide where these funds are used because uh, we hope this is, is heard by the Supreme Court and that they'll, they'll take this case up because the implication will be significant here to protect life. Uh, we'd have many states that would be able to defund Planned Parenthood. And of course, that's always been one of our goals at the federal level to defund Planned Parenthood. But with Nancy Pelosi in the House, uh, with Chuck Schumer, uh, being a gatekeeper in the Senate, stopping this defunding Planned Parenthood legislation. Uh, this is another great way to ensure that we do fund, do defund Planned Parenthood, and that's by allowing the states to have that voice. It is only right that when a, if a state were to decide, a governor decides that Planned Parenthood should be defunded, should not be allowed to have Medicaid funds, that's the right thing to do. This is the largest abortion provider in the United States is Planned Parenthood, and I'm grateful for the stance South Carolina has taken. I applaud them. And very importantly, they are clearly meeting the intent of what Congress did back in 1965. Senator, to that point, Medicaid reimbursements make up the bulk of Planned Parenthood's federal funding. Is there a way to reduce or eliminate this funding at the federal level? Well, we kept keep up that fight every day here, Catherine. It's just a challenge, of course, is getting enough votes. When you look how radical, the radical positions unfortunately, nearly every Democrat has taken. Back to these incredibly horrible positions they've taken here on the uh, Baby Born Alive bill. It says if a, if a baby is born as a result of a botched abortion, the Democrats can't even support protecting that life. That's infanticide. That's not abortion. And they can't even support that kind of legislation. Or you take a look at the Pain Capable Act, which simply states that at 20 weeks or later, late-term abortions, we're not going to allow them. We're going to outline, protect that baby's life and we can't get virtually any Democrat to support us on that. So if they won't support these fundamental common sense pro-life positions, you can see where they'll be on, on defunding Planned Parenthood. So we still have a long battle in front of us, but that's why it's so important that those who stand with us in pro-life are going to be very active this fall in November, because the way to change the outcome of Planned Parenthood funding in Washington, D.C., is to change the outcome of these elections and make sure we elect pro-life senators pro-life members of the House and a pro-life president. Senator, Planned Parenthood claims their facilities are part of state's health care safety net and stripping away Medicaid funds only hurt the uninsured or people with lower incomes. What is your response to that? Well, it's just not true. Um, we, we, we aren't suggesting a Planned Parenthood can't have, have funding, but when they, when they are funding it for these abortions, that is the problem. And so it's, it's really a, an argument that does not have merit. And, and there's other ways to provide health care, certainly importantly for women, uh, through our community health centers and so forth, where we can take those dollars that go to Planned Parenthood today and reallocate them 
to the community health centers, of which there are more of those than there are Planned Parenthood clinics. And so we want to make sure we take care of the health care needs of women. Of course we do. But abortion is not health care. And so that is why there's alternatives that would save the lives of babies, as well as, as ensure that women receive their health care that they need. Senator Steve Daines of Montana, chair and founder of the U.S. Senate Pro-Life Caucus, thank you for your time. Thanks, Catherine. For pro-life analysis on this topic, we're joined now by Mallory Quigley. She's the vice president of communications for the Susan B. Anthony List and joins us now via Skype from Alexandria, Virginia. Mallory, if the Supreme Court does take up this Medicaid case, as these pro-life lawmakers are asking for, what could the implications be for Planned Parenthood funding? Yeah, well, this is really exciting. We're glad that the court is taking a look at this, you know. Um, the state and federal government both give money to the Medicaid program, and uh, we believe that, that pro-life governors, like Governor McMaster's, they should be uh, have the authority to decide which entities are going to best provide for women and children. And this would uh, certainly get taxpayers out of the overall abortion industry to to say that no, there's there's better alternatives for women. Um, they don't need to go to Planned Parenthood. You know, we, we've done work on this for years through the Charlotte Lozier Institute and um, uh, the coalition group behind the website GetYourCare.org. There are so many other healthcare entities that are not only providing better health care for women, um, but they they are also doing so without um, being involved in the abortion industry. But can you clarify, Mallory, doesn't the Hyde Amendment already prevent the taxpayer funding of abortion? Right. So the Hyde Amendment prevents um, t taxpayer dollars being used to reimburse abortions that uh, fall outside of the situation of rape, incest, or to save the life of the mother. But um, the, the Hyde Amendment, it applies to different funding bills. There's a difference between the federal funding versus the state funding. So, um, and Hyde needs to be added every time there is a new program. So, yes, the Hyde Amendment does prevent the taxpayer dollars from being used to reimburse individual abortion procedures, elective abortion procedures. But anytime the government is sending any money at all towards the overall abortion industry, we, we know that money can be used for purposes that uh, are, are complicit in abortion. I mean, something like the Title X program, which for years Planned Parenthood used as a slush fund to pay for advertising, to, you know, keep uh, the electricity bills paid. Um, that was that was generally, part, you know, uh, contributing to the the abortion um, business at play there. So, thanks be to God, through the Trump administration and the Protect Life rule, uh, Planned Parenthood is no longer receiving taxpayer money through the Title X program. But this is really um, about whether or not we want any monies at all going to the abortion industry in any way, and certainly we don't. And to that point, and on this topic of Planned Parenthood, President Donald Trump did make a campaign promise in 2016 to defund Planned Parenthood. As you mentioned, he did cut Title X funding, but Planned Parenthood's Medicaid funding remains intact. What can be done to reduce or eliminate this at the federal level, if anything? Yeah, this is a this is a tricky question. Um, you're right, Pl President Trump. He's the first president to have such a clear impact on. Planned Parenthood's bottom line with that Title X money being their second largest source of taxpayer funding, Medicaid, of course, being the first. But uh, Medicaid dollars are really a combination of federal and state monies. So it's encouraging to see Governor McMaster and other pro-life governors in states across the country seek to reduce the number of taxpayer dollars that are going to Planned Parenthood and other abortion entities at, while we continue to research and see what can be done about this on the federal level. And Mallory, while I have you on a different topic, there was news that over 50 pro-life leaders wrote a letter to the FDA about the illegal internet sale of abortion-inducing drugs. Real quick, what do our viewers need to know about this? Yes. So. Catherine, I, it's so important that viewers understand the threat that chemical abortion poses 
to unborn children and women and the entire pro-life movement. We could pass so many pro-life bills, but if chemical abortion drugs are are coming in illegally through the mail, as the, as we are seeing from groups like Aid Access, um, this is really turning every American home into a potential abortion facility. These are very dangerous drugs that uh, people who uh, d- drug traffickers, you know, disgruntled boyfriends and husbands are using surreptitiously to take the lives of children and to wound women. Uh, And the abortion lobby prefers chemical abortion because it allows Mm -hmm. them to charge for an abortion while at the same time dramatically reducing their overhead costs and allows them to keep their coffers uh, filled during a time like this this, uh, pandemic when there's an increased um, look, look, everyone's looking towards telemedicine. Um, So it's very dangerous. We've got to make sure that the FDA continues to to hold the REMS in place and protects women and vulnerable unborn children from chemical abortion. Thank you so much, Mallory Quigley, Vice President of Communications with the Susan B. Anthony List. Thank you.